But if you have any trust in the U.S. Army's counterinsurgency manual, which warns that punishment without trial is an illegitimate action that enemies exploit to replenish their ranks, then the answer to preventive detention is clearly no. It is no if you look at the websites that use images of Guantanamo to recruit more fighters to the terrorist ranks. It is no if you believe the April 2006 National Intelligence Estimate, which argues that to defeat Al-Qaeda, the United States needs to defy terrorists from the audience they seek to persuade and make the Muslim mainstream the most powerful weapon in the war on terror, i.e. the United States needs to claim the moral high ground and convince the Muslim world And convince the Muslim world that this is not a war against Islam, this is not a war against Muslims per se, this is a fair effort to fight criminals. Unfortunately, there is no shortage of potential terrorist operatives around the world, but I believe that Guantanamo has made the problem worse, not better. Probably creating far more enemies for the United States than it has incapacitated. A new system of preventive detention would rightly be seen as another departure from the United States' commitment to the rule of law and would compound the problem, not solve it. So to conclude, I'll just reiterate that I don't think closing Guantanamo will be easy, but I think it is absolutely necessary. Convincing the American public to accept on U.S. soil some number of detainees that have been described for the past more than six years as the worst of the worst, will require strong leadership and admission of past failure. Securing international cooperation to help resettle other detainees who cannot be returned home or whose countries will not take them back will require patience, time, and resolve. Trying detainees in federal court may be messy, and challenging, particularly given all the attention that these trials will likely incur. And conceding that some detainees may potentially pose a threat but should be released just the same may be difficult for politicians to acknowledge. But we've seen that the alternatives are worse. In a sense, the United States has been running a controlled experiment for the past six and a half years in how best to handle suspected terrorists. And the results are out. Those dangerous men who've been brought into the criminal justice system are, to use one of President Bush's favorite expressions, no longer a problem for the United States. If guilty, they have been convicted, put away, and are largely forgotten. Who outside of the United States worries about Musawi anymore? They are not being used for propaganda purposes by groups like Al-Qaeda. Their treatment has reinforced the United States' status as a country of laws. It has not undermined it. Meanwhile, every single person who remains in the alternative system at Guantanamo remains an enormous problem for the United States. I think the lessons are clear. We should stop experimenting and we should absolutely not build another untested structure on a foundation of failure. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne, for the work you're doing. Thank you. Uh, you said you believe that the traditional criminal courts would, should be used for some of these men. Uh, but do you believe that Jose Padilla's trial down in Miami was fair? Reportedly, some of the jury members wore color-coordinated clothes of red, white, and blue on trial day. I yeah. knew I could expect some tough questions here. I didn't know it would be the very first one, but that's a, that's a very good point. And I would not, um, I think the Padilla case is a really hard case. Um, I didn't know about 
jury members wearing red, white, and blue, but I do know that the evidence against Padilla was very thin. Um, for those of you who are not as familiar with the case of Jose Padilla, he was um, an American citizen of Puerto Rican descent who converted to Islam and was picked up at an airport in Chicago and held as an enemy combatant for, I believe, about two and a half years. Um, so he's one of the very few people who have been held on United States soil in essentially a Guantanamo-like situation. Um, after a lot of litigation in the federal courts, the U.S. abruptly pulled Padilla out of his military detention and decided to prosecute him. Um, many people believe that this happened because there was a fear that the courts would um, condemn his detention as, as an enemy combatant. So he was added to a prosecution in Florida. And the evidence, you know, to the United States credit, and I think hey. to, you know, the, the shows the strong standards of the federal court, the United States did not, obtain, not try to use any of the evidence it had obtained abusively against him during the time he had been held as an enemy combatant. Um, so the evidence that it did use against him was very, very thin. And I think, you know, it's, it's fair to look at that verdict and wonder whether um, oh, it was it sufficient evidence to support a conviction and to support a long sentence. But that case really is one extreme. Um, I don't think it's necessary, that, you know, the case to be most proud of in the federal system, but I would say if you look at the overall record of the federal courts in handling terrorism, um, it's really quite good. And whereas that case, I think, is, you know, somewhat anomalous, or it's, the, you know, the extreme of the federal courts, a case like that would be good for the military commission system. So in making the comparison, let's be clear that um, Padilla may not be the best case in the federal courts, but it would be probably an average case or even a good case in military commissions. Um, actually, I'm following up on what he, he had done. I, I guess I was kind of stunned because I've, I've written a lot of articles, including academic journal articles, dealing with the federal courts. And uh, the federal syst criminal uh, justice system is I think at best a travesty. It's a horrible evil twin of what we have in the in the state system because of what can be admitted and what and this is more of a comment, you know, because there are other cases too. There's the Lackawanna Six case, which you know I think was a travesty. The uh, El Arian case with the professor in South at South Florida, in which the feds, this was in federal court, they start out with one set of charges, you know, that this guy is the, you know, the great terrorist leader of the world practically, and then as we start seeing their evidence, we find out they have none. And uh, um, is the system of justice in this country gotten to a point where we can literally hold the federal courts as some sort of standard of good? Because I can, you know, lay you chapter and verse time and again of the things that go on with federal prosecutors. Uh, you might want to read Bill Mushi's 10-part uh, series from 1998 on the, called uh, Win at All Costs about the lies of the federal system, or read uh, Paul Craig Roberts or Lawrence um, Stratton's book uh, that deals uh, with, with the federal system. And so I guess my question is, you know, have the system, have the standards of justice in this country gone so far as literally we can now hold the federal courts as some sort of shining beacon, you know, is, you know, is, is that where we are now? Well, I think you and I have a different perspective on the federal courts. Um, I clerked for a federal judge and I can really confidently say that there's no one who I would rather see handling one of these very difficult cases than the judge for whom I clerked. Um, I, yesterday, or, or Thursday that is, I witnessed the arraignment of the five alleged September 11th conspirators, and I witnessed how that judge acted in court, which I thought was um, certainly substandard. I can think of a dozen federal judges who'd be qualified to handle that case. Now, I agree with you that there has certainly been some overreaching in the past few years. Um, by federal prosecutors, but I think it's important to note that the courts have mostly, 